In 2017, Sean Parker sat down with Axios for an interview. Parker was the first president of Facebook. If you're an Aaron Sorkin fan, he's played by Justin Timberlake in the movie. But he now calls himself a conscientious objector to social media. In the interview, he said this about the social media empire that he helped to create. Quote, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. The thought process that went into building these applications, Facebook being the first of them, was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible? And that means we need to give you sort of a little dopamine hit every once in a while because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever, and that's going to get you to contribute more content, and that's going to get you more likes and comments. It's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because, get this, you are exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to church. There's another Silicon Valley insider I've been following for a while by the name of Tristan Harris. The Atlantic called him, quote, the closest thing Silicon Valley has to a conscience. He started out as a design ethicist and product philosopher for Google, and yes, that is a thing, but grew disenfranchised with the tech industry, which he said had kicked off a, quote, arms race for people's attention. So he left to start a nonprofit with the sole goal of arguing for a Hippocratic Oath for software designers, because right now, as a general rule, with most of tech, it is intentionally designed and engineered for distraction and addiction, because that is where the money is. Economists are calling it the attention economy. Years ago, Microsoft researcher Linda Stone said continuous partial attention is our new default setting. James Williams called the tech industry the largest, most standardized, and most centralized form of attention control in human history. I know I'm late to the party, and I'm a little embarrassed to say this, but I just finally got around to reading 1984 <laughs> by George Orwell, uh, which was, it lived up to all of the hype. And, you know, I've been hearing, we've been hearing a lot about it the last few years since the election, and I, my reading of it, I was shocked that it's used as a critique of the Trumpian right. To me, it felt far more like a scathing indictment of the left, which as far as I can tell was Orwell's intent, a dystopian communist version of England. And uh, one of my favorite, I say that because one of my favorite cultural commentary books of all time, don't read this, it's crazy depressing and it has no hope for the future, but is this little book from 1985 by the professor Neil Postman called Amusing Ourselves to Death which is all about the impact of TV and entertainment on American and Western culture. Chilling read, fascinating side note, his um, two areas of society that he predicted in the 80s would be the most damaged by TV and entertainment culture was politics and religion. In politics, he predicted that TV celebrities would replace intelligent, wise leaders. And in religion, he predicted that depth and discipleship would give way to superficial feel-good spirituality. So clearly he had no idea what he was talking about. Um, but anyway, that's a side note. He opens his book, best like preface to a nonfiction book of all time, with this compare and contrast between two of the most famous sci-fi novels and literary masterpieces of the 20th century, of 1984 by George well, Orwell and Brave New World by Huxley. Anybody read this? Yes. I just had my 14-year-old read this, and he was like, Dad, this is the world. It was so fantastic. And, you know, Huxley, in 1936, wrote of, quote, man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. He envisioned a future dystopia, not of dictatorship, but of distraction, where sex, entertainment, and busyness tear apart the fabric of society. And Postman just makes the point that, as a general rule, Orwell was basically wrong. And Huxley was basically right. The dictatorship of our day is distraction. Carlos Romani's recently said in the New York Times, our generation is the most distracted generation in human history. Of course, elites are all onto this. Harris is not the only refusenik in tech. Stories are leaking out of Silicon Valley of tech executives paying through the roof for their children to go to a device-free school, which to me sounds like the epitome of Biggie Smalls' maxim, never get high on your own supply. <laughs> our friend... 
Just, you're welcome. That's just for you. Yeah. <laughs> our, friend, our friend Mark Sayers calls this digital capitalism and points out that in this whole new attention economy, Silicon Valley, social media world, it's this weird mishmash of left and right who come together. Tinder's a great example. Leftics, leftist sex ethics with kind of right-wing free market capitalism. Together, Sayer said to me, in bed together on Tinder. I'm like, ooh, a double entendre, very good. <laughs> But it is this weird, for all of the talk about the polarization of left and right, they come together in the digital age. Seth, all just to monetize our attention. Seth Godin had that famous blog post a few years back, where, back when blogs were a thing. You remember that? It was like six months ago, forever ago. <laughs> he pointed out that your phone doesn't work for you. You paid for it, yes, but it doesn't work for you. It works for Apple or Google or Facebook. We want to believe that we are the customer. But like, that's, that's not the business model. How many of you pay $10 a month for Instagram? No, you're not the customer, neither am I. We are the product. And what is being sold is not just our data, which we hear a lot about on the news, and that matters because it makes us more vulnerable to marketing from you know, departments, sure. But what's far more chilling is that what's being sold is our attention. That's how they make money, off of our time and our attention. I don't know about you, but I am always shocked and so embarrassed by the end of the week when my phone gives me the little, this is how much time you were on your phone. I'm always like, I thought I had a job and a family. <laughs> Apparently, I just have a phone. Um, a recent study found that the average iPhone user touches their phone 2,617 times a day. The average user is on his or her phone for two and a half hours over 76 sessions. That is across the board for all, that's not iPhones, that's just all smartphone users. If you did the data and you just do millennials on iPhones, it's five and a half hours a day, over twice the time. Harris points out that slot machines, this is a weird factoid, slot machines alone make more money than the entire film industry and baseball together. The reason, which is, how weird is that? Because one, it's addictive. Once you start, you can't stop. And two, it's small amounts of money. It's like a quarter here, a buck there, five bucks while you're at the you know, airport in Reno or whatever. I don't know, just a long time ago. I remember I was there and there was a slot machine in the, I was like 12, I did not do anything, but whatever. <laughs> And you, know, you think, oh, it's just a buck here, it's just five bucks there, it's just, a little, it's just a few quarters there, and all of the sudden, all of your money is gone. And Harris just makes the point that in the same way, we lose so much time in the black hole of the device. But it's not just time. Some of us have time to burn. I don't. Most of us, some of us do. But far more importantly, we lose our capacity to pay attention. It was Edith Wharton, the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature, who a century ago coined the phrase, the power of sustained attention, as she was railing about the threat of this new technology called radio and how it was destroying the West's capacity to think well. Very few of us have the power of sustained attention. In fact, like I read one article not that long ago that said our attention span is dropping with each passing year, no surprise. In 2000, before the digital revolution, it was 12 seconds for the average American, which I thought, 12 seconds? It's not like we had a lot to work with, you know? <laughs> now, post iPhone, Wi-Fi, all of that, it's down to eight seconds. To put that in context, a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds. <laughs> We're losing to goldfish. True story, I read that in a scientific journal. Now, I don't want to sound like a harbinger of doom, okay? I feel like I need a Josh Porter fluffy cows picture right now or something. Um, and I have no desire, uh, like idealism is not helpful, I have no desire to go back to some mythical pre-digital utopia where I just farm all day long like Wendell Berry and in reality die of gout at like 24 or something. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm okay with the modern world. I love Apple Music. Can you imagine a life without maps? Can you, can you, it's just terrifying. I can't even fathom a life without maps or how I would live if I was not aware of the weather. But a dropping capacity for attention is a giant problem. For our society as a whole, think of the political mess we're in, the complexity of the globalized modern world. 
man demands the power of sustained attention just to get your head around it, much less to formulate an actual perspective that is more than an easy, lazy hashtag of slander. But the greater threat is to our soul, not just to our emotional health or to our capacity, you know, just to kind of live at ease in our own body and personality and healthy and happy, as if that's not enough of a reason, but even more importantly to our spiritual life, which again, that's easy to sentimentalize that language. We defined it a few weeks ago as our capacity to receive and give love in relationship with God and other people. Without the power of sustained attention, in all honesty, we can't have a spiritual life. Or not much of one. Much less grow and mature into people of love, which is what all of us at some level in our soul we ache to become. So, what to do? Well, last week we said the way forward is what early kind of ancient church people called a rule of life, which we defined as a schedule and set of practices and relational rhythms that create space to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do what he would do if he were us, and to really just live in alignment with our deepest desires, the kind of people we want to become, the kind of life we ache to live. The problem is, and this is what I want to talk about tonight, even if you come up with a rule of life over the next few weeks, and even if you do a really good job, it's, um, it's wise, it's thoughtful, it's kind of accessible enough, it's not like, you know, you don't overreach, but yet it's, it's rigorous enough to really get some traction in you, and it's a great fit for your personality and your stage of life and all of that stuff. The odds are that your phone alone, much less your computer or your TV or all the other stuff, will sabotage all of our best intentions. Just let that sink in. If your rule of life does not only take into account, but also find a way to ruthlessly eliminate digital distraction, it will likely fail. That is my deep conviction based in part on my experience as a pastor working with all sorts of wonderful people from across the spectrum of human variation, but also just in my own like antidotal experience as a follower of Jesus with an iPhone in the city. I mean, this is so embarrassing, but I have to tell you this story. So Thursday, I'm working on my teaching, and I had a bit of a a busy week, and so I cleared my day Thursday, no meetings at all, and the night, and to write a teaching takes like the power of sustained attention. And so the night before, I answered all my text messages, and I turned off my phone, and I put it away in a drawer in my home office and made a commitment to myself that I will not take it out until after I'm done writing my teaching the following day, which would likely be, you know, 4 to 6 p.m., somewhere in there. So I put it away, go to bed early, wake up the next morning, spend a little time in prayer, and then I get right to work early. I get about four hours in, and I'm humming. Like, I'm writing what Newport calls deep work. I'm feeling great. I'm doing all the stuff. Ooh, goldfish, they'll love that one. I'm working on all of it, you know, all the stuff. And you can only do that kind of work for so long. And so I kind of, I come to a halfway point, and I think, okay, time to take a break. Now, normally what I do is I just pop out the door and I go for a four four or five mile run and kind of get outside, clear my head, come back, take a quick shower, and boom, then I got another three, four hours in me. So I'm about to go out for my run, but I think, oh, I need like, I need to research that thing. I forget what year, I think it was what year was Amusing Ourselves to Death published. So I go to Google Amusing Ourselves to Death and my web browser comes up And normally I had pay for a news service, so there's some less ads and whatever, but I just canceled my New York Times subscription because I feel that it's just gone way too far left and I can't take it anymore. So so right now I just have it set on like BBC or something, which has all sorts of ads on it. So BBC comes up, and right at the bottom is this, this is so embarrassing, blatant like clickbaity ad. It's like former superstars who now work a nine to five. And then, and there's a picture of Julia Stiles, and there's one from her like 10 years ago, and then there's like a really bad paparazzi one where she just does not look good. It looks like, it's like very unflattering kind of photo, and you're like, oh, what's the story there? <laughs> now, now, backstory, this is where the demon of the digital algorithm is, is genius. So the night before, Wednesday night, That night, normally we don't watch movies or TV, we don't even have a TV in our house, we just have a laptop, but I broke my rule of life because I was tired and I'm I'm slowly watching the Bourne movies with my two boys for the first time 
don't judge me, you should, and for the record, so we, that, the night before, we watched number two, Born Supremacy, which is where Julia Stiles is, and don't do that, by the way, if you have an 11-year-old boy. Matt Damon is just way too much for an 11-year-old. Um, anyway, so don't judge me, but we, st- we watch it, that's my last thing, and then the next morning, ooh, what a coincidence, there's Julia Stiles, and she's in the movie, and I'm thinking, I just saw her in Born. You're right, I have not seen her in a movie in years. What happened? And I'm sitting there thinking, don't click, don't do it, don't do it. And then I click. Yes. Yes. And then it, then it goes to the, you know, the web page that has like 20 ads on it. And you have to scroll down and it has the big like next button. And they don't start with Julia Stiles. They start with some other celebrity you don't care about. And you have to click through and see a whole new thing of ads. So, like, at that point, you're like, and you turn it off. No, you don't. You think, there's probably 10. I can make it to 10. And so I click through, and I stay disciplined. I stay unfocused. Like, okay, click, scroll down, click, scroll down, click. I get to nine, turn over. I'm expecting Julia. What's the story? It's not Julia. It's Rick Moranis from Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And I'm like, oh, wow, what happened? Oh, tragic story. Google it on your own time. And keep going. I'm like, okay, it's going to be 20. Get to 19. Click over. Nope, it's not her. So then I, I just keep going. I get to 49. Because <laughs> at this point, I'm in so deep. I have to find out. Like, my OCD is through the roof or whatever. Clicks over to 50. It's still not her. It's a recipe for banana muffins, which is, again, the digital algorithm. I love banana muffins. I cook with banana a lot. It's a vegan plant-based thing. But... So finally then, I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I shut the browser. I go to Google for a proper search. Julia Stiles, where is she now? (laughs) Turns out she does not work a nine to five. The whole thing was a lie. She's like a very happy person who went to college and is very well educated and like decided to travel for a while. And she just hasn't been in a big movie in a few years. There's nothing to say. And I thought those stupid, gullible, naive people who are so easily manipulated by advertising that they click on these links. I looked down at the clock and I had lost 25 minutes. And then I say that, A, just to show you what an idiot I am, and B, that was in the middle of writing a teaching on digital distraction. (laughs) True story. So I say that, one, so you can all lose respect for me. And, and, and two, to say, I'm like, I'm with you in this. Like, I get, I, I'm shocked at how easy it is to manipulate me, at how easy it is to distract me at my, my lack of discipline, my lack of self-control, how I just get sucked in, how much time is lost into the black hole. And honestly, for me, just church stuff aside, pastor experience aside, just for me as a follower of Jesus, my phone is one of the, and the internet is one of the greatest threats to my spiritual life with God. So tonight, I just want to make a case for what I call a digital asceticism. Or another way to say that is a digital rule of life. Now, asceticism is not a word you hear on the street, at least not in our city, which is all about hedonism and distraction and fun. And it's about as non-Portland as you can get. The word goes back to the fall of the Roman Empire. If you know your church history, in the fourth century, two things happened simultaneously that created a huge problem for really strident followers of Jesus. One, the way of Jesus was legalized under Emperor Constantine and became the religion of Christianity and moved from, or the church moved from, a minority on the edge of society facing persecution to the majority, often now in the halls of power. And at one level, this was a grace, and women and children are no longer, you know, burned alive or thrown to a wild animal. But on the other hand, now for the first time ever, in four centuries in of the history of the church, you have what we would now call cultural Christianity, which is basically widespread compromise at a cultural level. Two, the empire by then was well into decline at every level, moral, sociopolitical, um, sexual, emotional, all leading up to the sack of Rome in 410 by the Visigoths and then more to come in the decades after. This is when Augustine wrote his famous book, City of God, as the city of Rome was literally in fire, in flames. And not long after that, St. Benedict wrote up his rule of life as a way, and, and the monastic movement in the West, which is different than other monastic movements, like in Egypt for that, in the West, it was, it was less of a, a way to escape from the world and more a way to escape for the world. 
Benedict's vision and others was to create a, a monastic community that was kind of a community of calm in, in, in a society of chaos, this kind of stability right in the middle of it. Have you ever been through a tour of a medieval monastery or church building somewhere in Europe? It's bizarre. A lot of them literally look like a castle and have like a turret on the top and a moat. And you're like, how, how far do you have to get from the heart posture of Jesus to have like a turret outside your church, you know? And not like, a, not like an architectural faux turret, like a turret where you would put people to kill other people. Like, you come to Jesus, we kill you, you know? And it's easy to judge, and, and there were mistakes made. But imagine if we were attempting to cultivate a community right now in Mogadishu or the Congo or Syria or South Sudan or in some kind of a failed state where literally your body is under duress just when you walk outside the door. The, the, the literally civilization was falling apart, and so the monastery became the center of law and order. It became the center of stability and civilization and learning and civility in this culture of chaos. And this is where the word asceticism comes from. It goes back to the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, agizomai, which is translated, if you have the NIV, NIV as discipline. And it's actually an athletic word. It was used for Greek athletes in the Olympics for their workout regimen. In fact, a number of Greek scholars argue that discipline is not actually a great word. A better translation would be a training regimen or a workout routine. The early monks who went out into the desert or up into the mountains of Italy to escape kind of that twin, you know, the corruption of the church and the decline of culture called themselves God's athletes. And they said in the same way that if you're an athlete, you put yourself on a strict training regimen, diet, exercise, sleep, all of that stuff, in order to change your body to become, you know, an amazing runner or a discus person or whatever. And, if, and what the early monks, male and female, said is, we, we are God's athletes. And so they would put themselves on a strict training regimen um, of spiritual disciplines, such as fasting, prayer, silence, solitude, confession, scripture, training to become people of love. My point is, they responded to the twin problems of the corruption of the church and the decline of culture, not by trying to be cool or fit in or make church awesome, or by just saying, ah, it is what it is, let's relax, that's just how it is, but instead by going in the opposite direction toward a life of discipline. Now, if you know your church history, you also know that asceticism has a checkered past, much of it was based on lousy theology as the New Testament began to interact with Platonic thought and they began to have really kind of masochistic and unhealthy view of the body. There was some self-hate, there was some OCD, some stuff that we're really wise to shy away from. But many have pointed out the parallels between our cultural moment and that of a St. Benedict or an Augustine before him. And it basically said that we, and I don't know if this is right, this is over my pay grade and I hope it's wrong, but that we many think that we are living at the decline of Western civilization and that the chaos, the anger, the anxiety, the outrage, the discord will get worse, not better. Hopefully they are wrong. Hopefully like another election cycle away, everybody will just be nice and happy and respectful and use Twitter with moderation and all of that stuff and everybody will disagree on the gist of what it means to be an American. But many say that's not going to happen. And so many have said, man, just as early followers of Jesus in that cultural moment were forced to really lean into discipline and into practices like silence and solitude and retreat, the time has come for us to really focus on some of that, and really in particular in relationship to technology in general and our phone in particular, which for so many of us is not just a distraction, but is like an IV drip into our soul for all things secular. Now, the Bible has nothing to say about the smartphone. I can't, like, take you to Revelation chapter 21 and be like, this is a prophecy. The locusts are actually, like, it's about Wi-Fi, like, whatever. <laughs> no, though I grew up in a tradition where crazier things were done with the book of Revelation. Um, but as far as I know, that's not about Steve Jobs and Apple and California. Um, there's no command in the New Testament for you to turn your phone off one day a week or delete alerts from your phone or turn your smartphone into a dumb phone or like none of that. Paul doesn't say anything about that. But, so I have to be really careful. I don't want to read my zealotry into you. But it does have, the writers of the Bible have a lot to say about attention 
and about the key role that it plays in our spiritual formation. Now, my, I was planning on teaching um, just kind of line by line through Romans chapter 12 and Paul's famous line, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That was I was planning on, but um, I changed my mind last minute just because all week long, I feel like the Spirit kept bringing one line in Psalm 16 to my mind, and to the best of my ability to discern, I feel like it is a word for our community. Psalm 16, would you just take one more look at this with me? Psalm 16, a miktam of David. Some scholars argue a miktam is a poem that was used for teaching. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. David is writing at a time of chaos. We don't know the exact occasion behind Psalm 16, but it was sometime during the life and reign of King David, which if you know his story from the Old Testament, was turbulent, all sorts of war and civil war and unrest. And in our own cultural moment of chaos, political chaos, social chaos, emotional chaos, the need to take refuge in God in his language or to find our inner calm and joy in our relationship to the living God who is with us and even more in us, the need for that is greater than ever. Of course, the question is how? Well, I think David has two things to offer us here. Now, again, this is not an essay or a you know, how-to list. This is a poem, and I want to honor the literature here. But I think there are two things in this poem. Keep reading. One thing he will do and one thing he will not do. First, what he will not do. Verse 3. I say of the holy people who are in the land... They are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. I I look at the the people that are holy, that are dedicated to God. They are the ones I respect, I look up to, I delight, I model my life after. Those who run after other gods, the opposite, they will suffer more and more compound interest over a lifetime. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods. That means make a sacrifice, as was the custom. I won't even take up their names on my lips. First, David says he will not go after the gods of his day and age. He's smart enough to realize that those who do, quote, will suffer more and more. Notice he doesn't say will suffer at the hand of God, and careful not to read that kind of a view of God into the text. Could be what he's saying, but I would argue it's far more likely they will suffer more and more at the hands of the very gods the people worship. I think of David Foster Wallace's line from his commencement speech at Kenyon when he's talking about that famous speech, if you know it, he's talking about how there's no such thing as atheism, how we all worship, follower of Jesus, Buddhist, atheist, all people worship. The question is who or what do you worship? And he just makes the point that if you don't worship something spiritual like Jesus or Yahweh, that, quote, pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. And then he just goes on to talk about you worship money, this is what it'll do to you. You worship power, this is what it'll do to you. You worship sex, this is what it'll do to you. You worship beauty, this is what it'll do to you. Pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. But the worship of other gods, or idolatry as it's called in the Bible, is tricky in a modern, western, secular world because our idols have been, for the most part, despiritualized. Even if there is a spiritual power behind you know, say money or sex or power, which I think there is a lot of the time, still its presentation, or at least its PR, is not as like a spiritual thing, but just as a secular thing. So I don't know about you, I don't struggle with like the temptation to sacrifice my firstborn goat to Moloch. It's just not like a thing. Maybe you do, and this is a safe place for all people, all right? I'm not here to judge you. But for most of us, it's not like that. And the danger for us as followers of Jesus in a secular age where the idols are more subtle, they're still here, but they're more subtle, and they're still spiritual, I think, but again, more subtle, is that it's easy to forget that we, meaning the church, are a counterculture. So easy to forget that. So easy to think that, no, we're just Portlanders, but we have Jesus. We're just Portlanders who, like, sprinkle the Holy Spirit dust on top or something, And it's easy, like many Christians in the Roman Empire, after the worship of Jesus was legalized, to compromise. To get, we've used this language before, to get colonized by secular culture. To get comfortable, to fit in, to settle in, to get numb, to sear your conscience in the language of the New Testament with sin. 
and to forget, oh my gosh, we are a counterculture. That doesn't mean that we're better than the city or that we think we're better or that we have it all together. That's not at all what it means. It just means we don't live the way that the city lives. We live in, an, in another culture, that of the kingdom of God. So we don't do money the way that the city does money. How many of your like, secular friends are really into tithing? <laughs> Guessing none of them. You're like, my Christian friends aren't into tithing. Exactly. <laughs> we don't do power the way that the city does power. We definitely do not do sexuality the way this city does. Oh my gosh, chasmic difference. With that, we don't do identity. Our, our, the way that we think about identity and what makes us us, very different from that of our city. We don't do relationships like our city does, where you kind of hit or miss, and it's consumeristic, and when there's thing, you move on. We just, no, we don't remotely do it. Again, that's not to say we're better or we have it all together. It's just to say we are a counterculture, and we, like the poets, say, I will not pour out libations, meaning I will not give my life and my resources, of which time and attention are two, to the things and the kinds of things that the people all around me do. But then David goes on to say what he will do. Take a look at five. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. All of my safety is in you. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a delightful inheritance. This is an agrarian, ancestral kind of economy where land was passed down to you. It's basically him saying, I have a good life. As I think about it, even in this time of chaos, and I need to take refuge in you, and I have fear, and there's, and there's secularism and corruption all around me, but actually when I think about it, when I give it my attention, I have a really good life before you. Verse 7, from there, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me, this deep inner part of my soul. I will keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Notice what he will do. He will praise the Lord and keep his eyes on the Lord. Now, in, in Hebrew poetry, there's a name for this from seminary that I can't remember. But when this happens a lot in Hebrew poetry, scholars tell us that two stanzas are put next to each other. And the second stanza in poetry either explains the first one or it adds color and depth to the one before it. And so that second line, I will keep my eyes always on the Lord, it explains and adds depth and color to what he means by I will praise the Lord. So what does it mean to keep my eyes always on the Lord? How, how do you do that? How do you look at God? You can't look at God the way that you look at Colin or look at Bethany or look at a tree or look at a building. How, how do you look at God. Well, take a look at a few other translations of the Hebrew. The ESV has, I have set the Lord always before me. I don't actually read the ESV, but that's the line that came as I was praying over this Sunday. That's the line that came to mind in that, in that language. Maybe the Holy Spirit reads the ESV. I don't know. But <laughs> I have set the Lord always before me, before my mind and my imagination. The New American Standard has, I have set the Lord continually before me. The NRSV, I keep the Lord always before me. This is like an early, I would argue, early kind of version of Jesus' later teaching on abiding in the vine. Jesus is saying, I'm sorry, David is saying, he will do all that he can to keep his mind set on God and the attention of his heart directed at God's goodness toward him. It was Willard, I think I, I use this quote pretty much every single fall, and I just, again, it came to mind. The first and most basic thing we can and must do is to keep God before our minds. Willard, a few years ago, and David, a few millennia ago, are both tapping into the same two truths. If you're taking notes, one, that attention is the precursor to adoration. As a general rule, when we slow down long enough to pay attention, which if you're like me, it's not all that often, attention both to God and to our life in his world, often it then leads to awareness because we're sleepwalking so much of the time or we're distracted so much of the time. All of a sudden we begin to realize how good God is. 
how good even our life is with all of its pain and all the chaos, how good our life is before God. A simple thing, a meal, a cup of coffee in the morning, just the, the compassion of God upon waking. And awareness then often leads to adoration. Meaning the more attention we give to God and toward his love and goodness, the more we find love well up in our own heart and just kind of burst out in praise like it was for David. I will praise the Lord. It just starts to come out of us. Praise, gratitude, affection, love, desire for God. Remember, time and attention are two of the most powerful ways that we have to love. When somebody gives you their time, and not just their time, but their attention. They're with you, present to you, not I have to go, not I look at my watch, and their emotional empathy, they connect with you, they give you attention. Man, you feel felt. We feel in those moments, we feel loved, and we feel loved well. The same is true for our relationship to God. Time given over to attention on God is both how we receive God's love coming toward us, and what a few weeks ago we called contemplation, as we look at God looking at us in love, and as a result are transformed into people of love. And it's also how we give love back to God. We give him our time. We give him our attention. We just direct the inner gaze of our heart to look at him looking at us in love. We give him the first part of every day upon waking. We give him the first part of every week on Sunday at church. Here's our time. Here's our attention. We give it over to you in love. And the more we do that, the more time we spend just sitting with our mind set on God, the more we index our heart toward love of God. And this is also how we set our soul on a trajectory to become like God, which leads to my second point. Attention is the portal to our spiritual formation, right? As the saying goes, we become like what we worship. At a neurobiological level, as I understand it, that's because what you give your attention to is the person you become. For neurobiology, theology, philosophy, spiritual tradition, all agree. The mind is like a kind of portal to our soul, to our whole person, the integrating center of our humanity. And what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, our life is little more than the sum of what we gave our attention to. This bodes well for those who give the bulk of their attention to God and his love and his compassion and his goodness and all that is good, beautiful, and true in his world. But it does not bode well for those who give their attention to the 24-7 news cycle of outrage and anxiety, and slander, and shame, and emotion-charged drama, or just the nonstop feed of celebrity gossip, titillation, and cultural drivel. As if we give it in the first place. Much of it is stolen by a clever algorithm out to monetize our attention. Through what scientists call neuroplasticity, and Paul in the New Testament just calls the renewal of the mind. What some scholars argue Jesus called repentance. We become what we give our attention to, for better or for worse, for life or for death, for heaven or for hell. Hence the high place, the New Testament writers, and really the Jesus tradition for thousands of years across the world has for the life of the mind, for what we think about, for meditation, for scripture, for reading, for who or what we give our attention to, because we become what we give our attention to. So at the risk of sounding like just a, a, a really angry zealot with spittle on his beard, I can't grow a beard. That's not an option. Clearly, that's not me. <laughs> but I honestly, I care about the future of the church in the West. I care about the future of the church in cities like Portland. And I care about you, not to sound sappy, but I really love you and respect you and thank God for you and pinch myself that I get to worship Jesus with you and I care about you and I care about me and I care about who the kind of people that we become, if attention is the doorway to our soul, and if what we let through that door will determine who or what we worship, what we come to love, and who or what we become, and if at the same time we live in a cultural moment where there are literally 
multi-billion dollar multinational corporations doing everything they can to make money off of our attention via distraction and addiction. I don't have a Bible verse for this, but my deep, settled conviction is that we have to take this seriously as followers of Jesus, not to mention just as citizens of America, that a lot here is at stake, that light the St. Benedict's and others who were living through the decline of Roman civilization and the corruption of the church, which in our day is on now on the right and on the left, we have to make sure that we don't go down with the ship. Again, I don't want to sound harbinger of doom, but we have to live sober and alert and wise. Postman, whom I referred to earlier, was a professor and a media critic, and in a later book, another famous book of his, called Technopoly, he wrote this, technology must never be accepted as the natural order of things. Every technology, from an IQ test, to an automobile, to a television set, to a computer, is a product of a particular economic and political context and carries with it a program, an agenda, and a philosophy that may or may not be life-enhancing and that therefore requires scrutiny, criticism, and control. We need to cultivate a healthy suspicion of technology. Technological and even economic progress does not necessarily equal human or spiritual progress, as heretical as that sounds in the modern Western world. Newer and faster does not mean it's better. What looks like progression is often regression with an agenda. Others get rich, and we get distracted and addicted. The Amish, you know, that we idolize in, I'm, I'm sure, all sorts of weird ways, but are such an interesting case study in this. Who are, we often don't think of them this way, but who are our brothers and sisters in Jesus in America? And it's a common misconception that they are against all technology. They're not. Go visit an Amish community in Pennsylvania or whatever, and you'll see a horse and buggy with a chainsaw or something in the back. Maybe not a chainsaw. I think so. I can't remember. Propane, whatever. I don't know. And they're actually just really selective and critical about what technology they allow in. When a new technology comes on the scene, rather than just adopt it with no suspicion or critical evaluation, they test it for, they evaluate it, they watch it for a little while from the sidelines. Like scientists in a lab, they let us volunteer for the human trial. Seriously, we are the lab rats. Then, after they watch us for a few years and see what a technology does to us, then they have a community-wide conversation and, and they discuss, will this new technology, the car, the phone, the computer, whatever it is, will it make our life better before God and together? Will it increase our love and our joy and our peace or not? For example, a famous one, they decided against the car because they decided, one, it would erode community, that if people had a car and they did no longer had to live within walking distance of each other, that people would become transient, mobile, relationships would break down, the family would scatter, and then it would make people more consumeristic. I have no idea what they were talking about yeah. at all. <laughs> and so they said, no, we need to live within walking distance of each other, and we need to live a, such a lifestyle that doesn't facilitate com consumerism because that will eat away at our love and our joy and peace. To be a fly on the wall when they discuss the smartphone. I say that just to say the Amish or a Neil Postman, who to us sound extreme and radical and fringe, bare minimum, they should teach us, oh, this hasn't always been normal, and it doesn't have to be normal, and bare minimum, we should adopt some of that healthy suspicion toward technology. So our practice for the week ahead is all up at practicingtheway.org slash unhurry. We continue this week to develop our own personal rule of life, which is kind of the plan for the fall, on the docket for this week. And just a reminder, all of this is invitational. You don't have to do any of this. Nobody's mad at you. We won't, like, peer into you and creep on you and see if you did it or not. Facebook will, but we will not. <laughs> and um, like, this is just all invitational. We are just here to do our best to follow Jesus and help you follow Jesus to whatever degree you want to, as best we know how. So all of this is invitational. But the plan for the week ahead is to come up with a digital rule of life. Kind of like, do it however you want, but basically what we envision is like a one-page addendum to the rule of life in the workbook. 
There is no right way to do this, which means there's no wrong way to do it. Here's a few best practices from all sorts of people. Digital detox, this is Cal Newport's thing. You can read his book. Basically makes a strong case that we're addicted to our phones. And if you want to change your relationship with it, the first thing you need to do is basically take 30 days and go off everything except what would get you fired from your job. And basically take a break, let your nervous system detox, and it literally is that at a neurobiological level, and then come back to it with a healthy thing. Digital Sabbath, again, you don't have to do this. You know, Bethany, who has a great relationship with her phone, she has her phone on on Sabbath because that's when she FaceTimes all of her family back in the South as a single woman. Totally get it. So much freedom and flexibility. But as a general rule, I think one day a week we're on the Sabbath, which for many of you is Sunday and would be church. One of the best things you could possibly do is turn your phone off or at least really limit your use on that day. We're remodeling the new building this week, and on my agenda for this week in my like Evernote to-do list thing is to talk to some of our people about, I have this weird idea. You know how like at a Muslim mosque, you walk in and they have cubbies where you put your shoes because it's a sacred place and you want to honor the place? How cool would it be to have that like a coat check system for phones? And you walk in and there's like a wall and... One of you, uh, no, nobody's into it. I think it'd be cool. Sacred space, it it will likely not happen, but I like the idea. Um, Digital Sabbath, parent your phone. It's Parenting 101. You know, your kids go to bed before you go to bed, and they get up after you get up. When our kids were little, the first number they ever learned before they could read or write was the number seven, because we bought them an alarm clock and said, you're not allowed out of bed until there's a seven at the front, right? Flat line, angle line down. Here's a pile of books. Here's some Legos. Do whatever you want as long as it's in bed because we need to sleep and have our time with Jesus in the morning, right? So that's just what a good parent does. In the same way, parent your phone just means it goes to bed before you. So in our house, phones go to bed. It sounds weird, but go to bed at 8.30 in another room where they are locked away and they don't get up until after, for us, we've spent time in the scriptures and in prayer and got our kids off to school. Um, Get a real alarm clock is another one to get your phone out of your room so you're not sleeping by it, so it's not the first thing there when you wake up. No devices in kids' rooms or in men's room in particular, but women is true for many of you in particular with pornography. So this is a hard and fast rule in our home. There are no devices in rooms. There's no, like, kids alone with a device late at night in a room with internet access. Not in a million years. One of the worst things. You're just kind of setting yourself up for failure with pornography. Turn off all alerts. Don't make TV the locus point of your home. These are just some, like, best pra- None of these are rules. Take it or leave them, just best practices, stuff like this. You may find it easiest to literally write up a list of rules. A number of us were inspired by Andy Crouch's little book, The TechWise Family, where he has like 12 rules, just about how and what and when and what limit for technology. Here's one. I, I would read you my example, but one, I might scare you off, and two, then you would hold me accountable to it. I don't want that. So... Um, <laughs> Here's one from Tyler Hans and Sarah. Tyler was just up here a minute ago. He runs all the comms for our church. He had this just on his computer. We were just chatting about it. He's like, oh, here's mine. Like pre, this wasn't like for the teaching this weekend. He just had one. Um, And I have one too, but here's an example. Um, Really fast, let me just read his to you. One, minimal apps on phone. More about utility than entertainment. Two, phone always on do not disturb, eliminating all noise notifications. This causes you to reach for your phone only when you need it, not when it needs you. Add spouse to favorite so that calls will ring, or your mom. Number three, (laughs) I added that, not in his. Number three, no unnecessary phone usage in front of your kids. Kids should grow up without seeing their parents always with a phone in their hand. Otherwise, it's teaching digital addiction as normal. Four, no phone at kids' sporting events, choir practice, etc. Kids should look over and see parents watching, not looking down at phone. Five, most Americans always have their phone within arm's reach. Continually challenge yourself to fight that. Take phone out of your pocket. Leave phone in different room. Leave phone at home whenever possible. Six, no phone at the dinner table. If I was writing that, it would be bold and in highlights and applied to communities as well. Moving on. Number seven, phone sleeps in a different room. Number eight, television in different room than family room. Create a living room where the furniture is pointed at each other, cultivating conversation instead of pointed at a television. Number nine, time limits on screens for kids. Notice not for adults. I'm not sure what's up with that, but okay. (laughs) Ten, apps on tablet limited to early childhood learning and creativity. No YouTube. 
11, only high-quality television and movies, entertainment as art or learning. Very similar to JM here. Notice I show up in his rule, abbreviated, but I'll still take it, all right? <laughs> I'm assuming that's me, I don't know. Number 12, one screen at a time, no scrolling on your phone while sitting in front of the television. 13, laptops only in the house, no permanent computer screen on desk. And 14, screen time is not used as a reward for kids. That cultivates an unhealthy draw toward digital devices. Now, I read that to you. That's not from some crazy pastor trying to show off. That's just from a dude in our church who has three kids and lives on 82nd. And this is just something he put in place in order to create the kind of family and spirituality and emotional health that is in alignment with his deepest desire. Now, you're welcome to copy his thing or take all the best practices, but that doesn't really work as well. You have to self-generate a rule based on your personality, stage of life, your rhythm, routine, but it has to come from the deepest desire in your heart for the kind of life that you want to live and the kind of person that you, before God, want to become and that you know God wants to become you to become, whatever that is. And it will be different for every one of us. I was just chatting to a young mom in our community Tuesday night at our meal who said um, she got off Instagram and she just had this throwaway line. She said, oh, it's because it's not an app, it's a way of life. Oh, man, you're right. And then she just said how fr the, the one, everything else, but about, everything about it has been great, except she's so frustrated because now people just assume that she knows everything that's going on, and they refer to Instagram stories rather than just telling stories <laughs> anymore or whatever it is. Now, you might stay on Instagram but get rid of your video games, or you might play some video games but get off Twitter, or whatever the thing is. The key is to get in touch with your deepest desires and then craft a rule of life or a digital rule of life to that end. Um, I came across this line from Dr. King a few weeks ago, and I don't think of him as like a critic of technology, but man, this was beautiful as we near the end. He said this, the great temptation of life and the great tragedy of life is that so often we allow the without of our lives to absorb the within of our lives. The great tragedy of life is that too often we allow the means by which we live to outdistance the ends for which we live. We have allowed our civilization to outrun our culture. And then listen to this. We have allowed our technology to outdistance our theology. I said this in the 60s. And for this reason, we find ourselves caught up with many problems. To end... You know, this is so weird to say. I've actually been kind of dreading this Sunday's teaching. It, you have been so gracious with me tonight, and I'm sorry this was so long. Thank you for your attention that I stole from you. But, um, but I, I've been nervous a little bit because, you know, this isn't like a Bible teaching. I don't have a, a chapter and verse for you about how to relate to your phone. But also in part, and I know it's not a black and white thing, and I know that I'm bent toward rules and I'm sensitive to that. But in part because psychologists make the point that the vast majority of Americans' relationship to their phone falls into the, the psychological diagnosis of compulsion. We have to check our phone again. We have to check a text. We have to reach for it when we have a moment. We have to look down at a stoplight and see if whatever. Um, if not, full-on addiction. And whenever you call somebody out on addiction or whether, whenever you deal with your own addiction, what's the gut response? Normally, anger, denial, minimization, blame shift, you know, turn it around on the other person or whatever, and you've all been so gracious. You've not done that. Thank you. I've yet to read my email, but thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's because it's hitting such a deep nerve. Experts on addiction all say that the neurobiological-like addiction in your nervous system, yes, that's a legitimate thing, and the withdrawal on the surface. That's not actually what addiction is about. The, the real root cause, they argue, of addiction is always an inability to face the pain of reality, whatever that pain is for each person. Loneliness, singleness, marriage, the disappointment of a marriage or of children, failure, body image, doubt, a broken or dysfunctional family, a torn relationship with your mom. It could be anything, just reality. We're so bent to escape from reality, from the pain of reality. This is true of addictions to classical things like drugs and alcohol, but it's just as true of the stuff that we're mostly okay with, like hurry and workaholism, sports, and busyness. 
and Instagram and shopping. They're all at their core an attempt to escape into a fantasy life. As T.S. Eliot once said, humankind cannot bear much reality. I was driving down Burnside the other day. I'm on Burnside a lot, and I had passed three sex shops in about five minutes. And it just struck me as I was driving past one, and my, my boy Jude in the back said, Moses, don't look, which is so awesome, <laughs> which immediately meant Moses was like, at what? Uh, you know, <laughs> thanks, Jude. But, and I just, I was struck as we were driving, man, the number of sex shops that have the word fantasy in the business title. Like, what is that? It's an attempt to escape from reality. The reality of this is my body. I don't look like Chris Hemsworth. Okay. I'm just getting to that age where I see older pictures of me and I think, dang, I don't look like that anymore. Hmm. My daughter literally picked up my new book, and there's a picture of me in the back, but it's a couple years old, and she goes, Daddy, you look so much younger. <laughs> thought, thank you so much. But there's that attempt, seriously, to, to escape. This is my body. This is my sexuality. This is my marriage. This is my, I don't have a marriage. This is my ex-marriage. This is my whatever it is. This is my orientation. This is my, what, it's an attempt to escape from the pain of reality. But if we're not present to the pain of reality, neither are we present to the joy of reality. We don't accept all of reality with no filter. This is hard, this is pain, this is a disappointment. We never get to experience, oh, the boundary lines have fallen for me in good and pleasant places. I have a delightful inheritance. In all of the chaos and all of the fear, my life before God is rich and good. And the good news, or if you prefer gospel, of Jesus and his kingdom is that all of us are welcome to live in the kingdom of God with Jesus. And when we live in the kingdom with Jesus, we can face the reality of our life with all of its pain and all of its joy, and be okay. Like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter five of Matthew, we can live, all of us can live blessed, or another way to translate that, happy, fortunate, and well off. Even if we're, think of his list, poor, meek, persecuted, hungry, thirsty, even if nothing about our life is blessed from our culture's perspective. You make your own list. Even if we're in a marriage that's in a disappointment, have a chronic illness, still single at age whatever, sad about our family of origin, not in the job we want, stuck in a, you fill in the blank. We can still live blessed. We can wake up in the morning and say, I'm fortunate because I'm living in the kingdom of God with Jesus. That is good news. Let's stand together and pray. Thanks for listening to the Bridgetown Church Podcast. As many of you know, we're nearing the end of a year-long capital campaign to raise money for and buy this beautiful historic church building right on the inner east side of the urban core of Portland, Oregon. We can't wait. We're in the remodel project right now. Hope to move in in March of 2020. But right now, we're just raising money as a church to pay for this beautiful space. If you're a podcast listener or follower from another church, another city, and anything at all moves in your heart and you would like to give back, and contribute toward our church and this project over and above whatever you give to your local church, which we're all for. If you have any questions or thoughts, just visit bridgetown.church give or shoot us an email for more information. Grace and peace.